Okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Matilde um, Tristani Farinha. Um, Matilde is at the ETH Zurich doing her PhD in deep learning, neuroscience, and artificial uh, intelligence. And today she's going to, to present her recent paper, Equilibrium Propagation for Complete Directed Neural Networks. Sounds really nice. So welcome Matilde on stage. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. You can hear me well? Yeah, very well. Okay. And we can see your screen now. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk, actually attending my talk. Um, so I'm here to talk about the research I've done during my master thesis, which was done under the supervision of Professor Sergi Paquito, Pedro Santos, and Mario Figueiredo. Um, in one sentence, what we did is basically propose a biologically plausible learning algorithm for recurrent neural networks, which have asymmetric feedback connections. Um, before going further into the subject, I wanted to, uh, sorry, I'm actually in the wrong slide, sorry. Uh, I wanted to motivate uh, why these type of algorithms matter. So first of all, uh, brains are great because they are actually the best uh, learning machine that we know of. And we can kind of suppose that if we try to bridge this gap between neuroscience and machine learning, we could actually get better learning algorithms. Uh, in fact, looking into the history of artificial neural networks, that's actually what we can see. Um, second of all, uh, the Moore's law has been failing for a few years now. And uh, scientists have been looking for new types of hardware that could surpass this threshold. Uh, and these new types of hardware require new algorithms. And one of these type of hardware is neuromorphic hardware, which is inspired by the structure that we have in our nervous system. It tries to mimic it. And um, these type of algorithms inspired by uh, that work on energy functions or vector fields are thought to be actually efficient for this type of neuromorphic hardware. Um, okay. So when we talk about biologically plausible, I want to explain a bit better what we mean with this. And uh, we refer to certain characteristics that the model can have. For instance, a local learning rule for the synaptic whites, meaning each white is updated based on the activity of the neurons it connects, having the single type of computation for the feedforward and feedback passes of information, and also having asymmetric feedback connections. Um, then we can also consider that there, are, there is no like a, a strict restriction on the architecture, so no strict layer-wise architecture. Um, and we should also be able to consider that we have sparse representations of information uh, in the network and not just those usual dense representations that we observe. Um, this model was inspired or is actually a variant of equilibrium propagation and with its, uh, with its, in its version of asymmetric feedback weights but it, it, it's, it differs a lot from this previous algorithm because we introduce a new neural dynamics, um, which accounts for the weighted incoming uh, stimulus to each neuron and also the outgoing uh, stimulus of each neuron. And this has a neat biological property, uh, which is that it preserves the grand mean firing rates um, in the network uh, when there's no external stimulus. And this has been observed in vivo for the hippocampal neurons. Uh, we also drive some uh, interesting uh, theoretical uh, sufficient conditions to guarantee that we have convergence in the inference phase and that you can see better on the paper. Um, and we also propose a new learning rule that accounts for the fact that we have these asymmetric feedback weights. And um, it's based on a numerical integration of a uh, biologically plausible weight dynamics, which has been previously proposed in the past. And uh, it is biologically plausible because it, it, each update the, uh, the update of a weight depends only on the activity of the presynaptic neuron and the rate of change of the postsynaptic neuron. Um, we consider uh, that the architecture, the initial architecture, is a complete directed graph, so an unrestricted architecture. And because this is uh, so unrestricted, uh, depending on the task at end, many of these connections are actually not necessary. So we also introduce a sparsity inducing method that removes these irrelevant connections. Uh, in this method, basically a certain weight can be removed with a probability taken from a Boltzmann distribution to find across the incoming connections of every neuron. So the idea is that uh, the strength of a certain weight is proportional to, to its importance in the network at the moment. 
So through what training we are able to remove these less relevant connections. Okay, uh, so we claim that this could possibly be a better learning algorithm uh, because um, contrary on these simple uh, kind of proof of concept tasks, such as learning the XOR, uh, it is able to learn contrary to its previous asymmetric formulation. And uh, down uh, and on the, the down plots, you can see the mean squared error. Um, so basically the full green line, the, sorry, the full dashed line is the mean squared error for our model. And you can see that uh, it goes to zero. Uh, I, I, I refer to to the green line because that's the inference. The, the red one is not inference. And then for the for the previous model, you have the the sorry, our model is the dashed line, and you can see that it goes to zero. And then for the previous model, we have the full green line, and you can see that it doesn't converge to zero. And we tried a lot of tuning on this. Um, on the right, we have the decision maps that we obtain uh, for our models uh, for our model for simple uh, logical operation operations when learning these operations and the uh, x axis represent the inputs and the color represents the value of the output so dark blue is zero and dark red is actually one yeah and um, we say that it generalizes well because throughout training we only give uh, samples of zeros and ones but then in inference after training if we give uh, samples in between zero and one the model is actually able to classify these samples based on their proximity to the previous samples that it saw during training. So it's a very simple um, way to show that it generalizes. Um, uh, below, we have the prunes optimized uh, networks that we obtained when we train the network with uh, our sparsity inducing method. And um, we can see that for some tasks, simpler tasks such as the end and the R, the, the model is actually able to capture the essential connections between the neurons. Uh, I forgot to say that the red neurons are the inputs, the green neuron is the output, and the bias neuron uh, is the blue one. Uh, for more complex tasks, that does not happen. So uh, regarding future implications, as I said, because this model can be seen as a continuous time dynamical system, it is well suited to be efficiently implemented in this new type of hardware called neuromorphic hardware. Uh, we can also look at this sparsity inducing method that we introduce as a network design tool, because these kind of optimized and possibly minimalistic uh, network architectures could be used as an initial architecture for other learning algorithms, for example. And I think that's it. So basically, uh, as Alex said, I'm currently a PhD at ETH, working as a researcher at the, at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. And on the right, you can have the you have the QR code to the paper for more information to the GitHub uh, uh, code, and uh, my Twitter tag name if you want further updates on my future research. Thank you. Let me know if you have questions. Thank you very much, Matilde. That's really nice. Um... I'm waiting for, I've actually, by the way, I, I, I put the um, a link to your paper on the chat and I right away copied the, the GitHub uh, link. Um, are there questions for uh, Matilde from the audience? Uh, remember, you can ask on the uh, Q&A tool or directly in the chat if you, if you wish. Um, in the meantime, so... Can I ask a question? I, I can't type in the Q&A for some reason. That's right. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, a funny feature of Zoom. You can, you can go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I was wondering about your, uh, how do you sparsify the, the networks that, that you use? What pruning mechanism you use or, or how does that work? Hmm. Okay. So uh, at start, you have this complete uh, directed graph. And then uh, at each epoch, you uh, define a Boltzmann distribution for every neuron, and this both distribution is defined across the incoming connections of that neuron. So each weight will have a certain probability of being removed, uh, inversely, pro uh, inversely proportional to its strength. So the stronger the weight, the less likely it is to be removed. And then you kind of randomly remove a few weights at every epoch. And that gives us this type of, so it's, it can reach this type of minimalistic network where it only has the essential connections. Yeah. I see. So effectively, you maintain the same performance or take a very, very tiny hit in performance while removing those extra connections. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the same performance. So this is all 100% performance. Like these are very simple 
operations, learning logical task, logical, uh, sorry, simple tasks, learning logical operations, but it, this is all results for 100% accuracy. Yeah. Um, Itamar Landau from the audience is asking if, if you can uh, say again how the learning rule works. Uh, learning Replication. rule. I think it would be good for... Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So the, the learning rule, uh, you uh, maybe you're familiar with STDP, spiking time dependent plasticity rules. And uh, the basic idea is that you update the weight based on the presynaptic activity of the neuron and the postsynaptic, uh, the change on the postsynaptic activity of the neuron. So uh, the rate, the change in the, the rate activity of this neuron. And um, in this case, uh, what we, so a simple step would be to take uh, um, the, the first state that you have in these neuronal dynamics. So th there are actually two, two time lapses here. So one, in one side, you have the neural dynamics evolving, and on another uh, time scale, you have actually the epochs, so the, the white dynamics, the updates on the whites. And uh, to do so, uh, the, to do the updates on the whites, you actually require information about the neural dynamics, because that's the whole point, that you have these local learning rules dependent on the activity of the neurons. And um, you can, uh, a simple way of doing this would be to take the first, uh, stable state on the neural dynamics and the second stable state. So this is the thing where I talked about that we have two phases of training. So one is the a free phase where you have no information about the output. And the second is a, a clamp, clamped or SME clamped phase where we, you actually have some information about the output. And usually these learning rules uh, take these two states and use these two states to, to as the, the change in the postsynaptic neuron, meaning you only need the, the free state for the presynaptic neuron, and then you need these two states for the postsynaptic neuron to have this change, direction of change uh, on the activity of the neuron. But yeah, that's basically it. And if you want to be more accurate in the integration throughout this time evolution of the neuronal dynamics, then you can do like numerical integration where you consider like every uh, so, uh, subsequent uh, pair of uh, different activities throughout the neuronal dynamics. I don't know if that was uh, very clear. Yeah, I think it's much clearer now. And I hope that answers uh, Itamar's question. Um, so probably, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, of these discussions uh, going on about whether backpropagation is biologically plausible or not. Um, hmm. Do you take a strong stand on a side? Uh, would you argue? I, I didn't know. Okay, I didn't know there was actually a discussion on whether it was biologically oh, yeah. possible or not. I, I thought it was well established that it was not, because it, it, it seemed to several be very reasons well established. point. Yeah, it seemed to be very well established, but there are some people uh, arguing, um, um, like uh, mm, arguments okay. to to. Okay. Uh, well, can, I think maybe you can send you some links. Yeah. yeah anyway, like that's. I mean. It's like, a fair there point. are several reasons, but for example, th th there are several arguments that, I mean, backpropagation maybe approximates something or it's a way to, but, but even, yeah. So two neurons are not symmetric, right? You have dendrites, you have synapses, you're not, it's not the same. And uh, one problem will always be the fact that you need symmetric connections to do backpropagation, right? You need two neurons communicating both ways with the same weight. You can't have this kind of asymmetric, when I say asymmetric feedback weights is that you have some feed forward neuro, uh, weight that has a certain value and you allow for the feedback weight to have a, a different value even if you are connecting the same two neurons. And in backpropagation, you have to assume that this is the same weight that goes both ways. And when you think about neurons, that's, that's not what you observe, right? I mean, yeah. this is a simple uh, reason that could rule out backpropagation yeah. in terms of biological plausibility. But it's mm -hmm. very nice, it's very efficient. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, out of curiosity, so this is work you did in your previous uh, position in... Uh, Portugal, master thesis. Right? Master yeah, thesis. Master yeah. thesis in Portugal. And you, in your PhD, you keep on working on uh, on, on this uh, topics, so biological learning rules. Yeah, yeah. Not not exactly the same algorithm, but yes, that it's the same topic. Great, so for the audience, if you wanna learn more about uh, all this uh, biological learning rules and plus a bit biological possibility in your networks keep track of uh, Matilda's work in the future and yeah with this I thank you again for for your talk for uh,
presenting us uh, your recent paper. And we'll move on to, to our next speaker, uh, Dennis Tuku. Thanks, Matilde.